you got the impressions, you got the jokes, you got the personal things. Nobody else could ever tell except you because you lived them and they're funny. And how do you tell stories? I mean, that's another lucky asset I inherited from my grandfather and, and, and the family that storytelling it becomes a very passionate, animated thing when you're not even trying. So I always said, oh, I love stand-up. And I used to watch this show called The A-List on uh, Comedy Central. And basically it was, say, 20 comedians that were all talking about soda. And then they were talking about phones and dogs and whatever the subject was. It was one joke per comedian on those. And, and it was a really nice way to watch comedians instead of seeing everything that they were talking about. You got to see all everybody's take on it, everybody's personal take on this particular subject. And that's when I said, you know, I know I can do that. So uh, but a lot of years went by and I was like, ah, you know, I started writing things down. And the thing about that is once you start you're writing them in your sleep. You're writing them in the shower. I used to crawl down off of roofs and go to my car and start writing down the jokes because I didn't want to forget them. And what happened was just as I, I, I decided to call up a guy from Stand Up New York and ask him, can somebody help me? So the guy said, sure. I go in to meet with him. He tells me to grab the microphone and get up on stage and tell him a little bit about myself. I get up there literally for five minutes and he tells me, you're ready. You're ready. I go, what do you mean I'm ready? He goes, trust me, you're ready. Uh, and then two weeks after that, he booked me my first gig. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So what happened was uh, I did a couple shows. They were very good. Um, about three weeks in, I was doing my fourth set. Now, this is October 13th, right after 9-11. You could still smell everything in the city. And nobody was want wanting to laugh. I one thing I didn't like was the, the guy did tell me I explained how much I love impressions and he told me that's hack material and totally derailed me in the area meanwhile they're still doing them today this is how many years ago 25 years ago wow. they're still doing them today and everybody always loves impressions so uh, so I took that I didn't I didn't go crazy with it in my in my routine but um, I ended up doing a night at stand up New York packed house had these people laughing so hard that when I listen to the tape, I just get chills because I remember this one lady laughing so hard and a guy in the back, oh, 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 oh. It was just so great to listen to making people laugh. And at one point, they put the light on to get me off stage. I didn't even see it. I ended up running out of material and using jokes that were only half written and not even, and they were still laughing. So for me, I loved it. To, to cut that story down, um, I got a call to do Starlog 17. Again, right after 9-11, very emotional, powerful, patriotic play. I went I to see it. Want it to... Yeah, did you? Yeah, I went to see it. Nice. I, I, actually didn't didn't want know, to... I actually didn't know you were in it. I was seeing it for Elliot. The one who oh, got... and, and Elliot was the one who took Susan Batson's class with the pooping in the bucket. Oh, ah, the, the guy at who said ease, at ease. At yeah. ease, yeah. And so, a funny thing, not, not to really take away from you, but okay. talking about committing and staying in, in focus, I think you went on a bed and the bed collapsed. And you, and you, me? Yeah, you were laying on a bed and like you threw it up like, man, I can't even get a decent bed in here. I mean, I knew, <laughs> I knew that wasn't part of the play, but hey, it was real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there were a few moments like that. Um, that was a very intense play, you know, uh, yeah, you between did. Manfred and uh, Manfredi and Johnson getting killed in the beginning to to beating up John French and throwing him out that door. The way he fought to stay in there, and when I was beating him up before we threw him out, I mean, it was it was very 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 big. I, I love the movie. I never turned the movie off ever since the play. And I was just thinking the other day, I, I don't like remakes. And as classic as that was, was, that would be one amazing remake of a film. Mm. I really think so. Anyway, so um, as that was ending, me and John French and and, uh, and James, you know, Jay, Fre uh, John came to me and said, Lou, I wrote this piece, this little short, and I had me and you in mind when I wrote it, and I was wondering if maybe you could get some of those guys who might be interested in filming it. Now, James was a tremendous, still is a tremendous actor, and he said, Lou, whatever you guys are doing, I want to be a part of it. I don't care if I'm holding the boom. So me, James, and John got somebody else who did the camera stuff for uh, the comedy show. 
and got him to film it for us. But it turned out that we decided, we realized we could all work together great. We could put a rock on the table and have a script in an hour. And then, and, and if we didn't see eye to eye, we found a way to make the other guys see eye to eye. And before we knew it, we made a short film. We decided to make crawl space films. We made one short film about World War II, Futility. And uh, we won a, a bronze medal at the Houston Film Festival. And two years later, we ended up, uh, I wrote and directed one called The Man That Blew Up the World. And I was going to be in it, but decided James, you know, I know James could play the part, so I'd like to direct it, make sure it was everything I wanted. We won a gold Remy at that. We won another, I don't know if it was gold or silver, for one called The Good Fight. And that was our last and final short film before we started to make the feature, which unfortunately, everything fell apart at that point. Because you know what? The other guy, the other partner, it was not his passion. It was not his dreams. He didn't have enough oomph to keep going, and he started complaining that short films were never going to make us money when I knew we had what it took to eventually get to where we were going. And, uh, you know, who got married and had a kid and who ended, it's like uh, Brian Adams' Summer of 69 song, you know? It's like everybody went their own way, and I'm the only one that just kept going and uh, wanted it more than anybody else did, you know? All right, so what's uh, happening next for you? Uh, well, I had a heck of a year. And uh, things really took off. I ended up, it all started with um, getting a lead in Grave Mysteries on the ID channel. And then from there, I was really hurting for money. So I broke the cardinal rule that I wasn't going to do any, any extra work. And I did a part on The Deuce. Ended up meeting Chris Coy, who was very, very cool. We talked about doing it getting there and everything like that. It was really fun. And um, what happened was I ended up getting an audition for Gotham on a Thursday, blacklist on Friday, went the whole weekend thinking, ah, I blew it. I didn't get either of them. Got the call for Gotham on Monday. I was shooting that Thursday and Friday. Blacklist wanted to see me again the following Friday. The next thing you know, I went to I auditioned for Bull three times. I auditioned for Blacklist four times. Uh, the Enemy Within, and all these great shows started coming up. And then I booked the, uh, another coast after I booked the co-starring role on Gotham. So then I ended up booking another co-starring role on the TV uh, HBO comedy High Maintenance. And again, I worked with a tremendous production crew and cast, and everybody was so friendly and so supportive. And and it's just been going. So we got the new year. We knew there was going to be a break during Christmas. I ended up getting an audition in between there that uh, I got a call back for on Tuesday. But then just this past week, um, well, last year I auditioned for Blue Bloods too, but uh, I just auditioned last Wednesday, got a call back on Friday. I met with the producers, the writers, the directors, the head of the casting uh, office, and uh, that was all new for me. But I'm hoping I get it. I'll probably know Monday or so. So I have that. I just auditioned for something on Comedy Central that I thought I did very well with. Waiting to hear back from that. I ended up with another audition on Friday for Blacklist while I was prepping for this uh, callback on Friday for Blue Blood. So I actually had to make a self-tape, which is all new with this digital age. It was something new that when I got back into it full-time, I had to totally try to learn and understand how this all works. So now I got myself a little studio down the basement. I got a backdrop. I got lights. I set up all my shots and shoot my self tapes at home. And then, um, which is very convenient when you can't be there because I had never had this many auditions in my life. So my thing was, how can I be all places at one time? You can't, this, this helps. So, uh, now I have four potential projects all coming up. Unfortunately, all their outside dates are like the 22nd to the 31st. So I don't know how it works if I book everything. I'm trying not to get too ahead of myself and, and stress out over how am I going to make this work because that's what my agent's for to help. And my agent happens to be some of the sweetest, most inspiring and encouraging people that I have ever come across. And I don't know what I'd do without them. I mean, it's been that much of a, of a, um, a difference maker. And I owe all of that to a friend of mine 
named Michael McFadden, who is also a tremendous actor, who I met. I mean, this is how weird things happen. I had a friend I did a film with down in Jersey that never got completed. She was making a film with somebody who needed mob guys, and she said, Lou, this would be perfect for you. And I ended up <clears throat> driving all the way to Philly to be an extra, not getting paid, something I would never do in a million years. And when I did that, I met the lead actor. We became friends. He referred me to his agent, and the rest is history. It all changed my life in that way. Why does art matter? Well, art matters in so many ways because not only is it an outlet, but, and I don't understand. I mean, I get it. Some people aren't creative, but I don't, I don't know if they're just not looking in the right creative areas because art is being creative and whether it's music or singing or dancing, I mean, I can't even hear a song without picture and choreography in my head. That's another thing I would have loved to, to do. Um, it depends on how much joy it brings you. Be an artist. It's not just a pen and a, pa a, a, a paintbrush and a canvas. And it matters because if that brings you the kind of joy it brings me, then you need to do it. That's why whatever artistic outlet that makes you happy, you have to do it. You have to at least do it, even if you're just doing it in your own house. But obviously, making a living at it would be the ultimate, it's the ultimate goal. I don't care about it. I mean, if you paid my bills and said I could be on this TV show for the rest of my life or keep making movies the rest of my life and I knew my bills were paid, I'd be happy with that. Awesome stuff. Lou, thank you so much for being on the show. Wow, lots You're of great welcome. stories. And uh, thanks again for being on the show. And uh, best of luck with your future endeavors. Take care. You too. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Like I said, he is... Uh, an embodiment of perseverance and he tried all kind of jobs under the sun and just ways to support himself it's the hard hard thing about an actor's life jobs are few and far between sometimes and you know you got to pay the bills you got to do whatever you need to do to survive and still find a way to pursue this dream granted the rewards can be huge whether you're in Movies or TV or voiceovers or some other form of acting, it can be big dividends. But man, oh man, it is a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of grinding, a lot of hustling. And he is finally seeing the fruits of his labors, and I'm very proud of him to stick with it this long. And, you know, it's challenging because. With acting, you just never know when your next job might be, but you don't know that maybe the next one is the one, or it can lead to something else. So you got to hang in there. And much of what this podcast is about is what Lou tied up in the end with why art matters. If you're feeling that creativity, just do it. Answer the call. Whether it's painting, singing, acting, writing, drawing, you got to answer the call. That's your creativity calling you. And that is so blissful. Once you answer that call, you'll be so glad you did. Trust me on this. And stick with it. And of course, if you are trying to pursue this as a career, learn your craft. Take classes. You know, Do whatever you can to be prepared, especially in acting. Because there's nothing worse that happens when all of a sudden opportunity strikes and you are not prepared for it. It could be devastating, and you may not, you may have just missed your dream by that much because you just weren't prepared for it. So, do your work, learn your craft, be prepared for when opportunity will come knocking at your door, just like it has with Lou. And I'm happy to report that he has officially gotten his SAG AFTRA card. It is a great achievement. He put in his time and he paid his dues and now he's an official member of SAG-AFTRA. Way to go, Lou. You definitely deserve it. As do each and every one of you guys out there who are listening and hopefully being inspired and wanting to go out and create your own art. Hey, that's what this is all about. I'm trying to bring you great content and great interviews with people 
to get you motivated and inspired 